denk dat je niet zo vreselijk veel macht hebt om dingen anders te laten gaan. Dat gebeurt gewoon. Maar ja, ik ben wel blij dat ik uh, gewoon nog leef natuurlijk. Ik wil het aimer. Compleutement. Distordu. Il est là, il n'est plus là, mais en même temps il est là. Quand tu as le spalle un dolore, una sofferenza del genere, apprezzi anche le piccole cose. Eh, non è scontato niente, non è scontato che respiri, non è scontato che stai in piedi e cammini, puoi correre. Eh, non è scontato vedere il sole, non è scontato niente. Bijna verdwaast rond in een trans rond. Um, maar ik moet zeggen, de zorg eromheen is wel heel erg goed. En ja, het was een heftige tijd, maar wel een mooie tijd. Welke gevoelens ik heb ervaren. Ja, je bent ontzettend nauw betrokken bij, uh, bij mijn vrouw, wat die meemaakt. En je, je, kunt daar, je kunt daar niks mee, maar je moet er uh, zelf mee uit de voeten. En je hebt wel het volle vertrouwen, dat had ik wel steeds. Sono un medico di terapia intensiva, non un rianimatore, nel senso che lavoro con i neonati, quindi mi occupo di tutt'altra, di, di, di bambini molto molto piccoli, non, non, non faccio il loro stesso lavoro, però chiaramente il rapporto con i medici è stato condizionato anche dalla, dalla mia posizione, tra l'altro sono dei colleghi perché sono nel mio stesso. Quindi da una parte avevo, ero sicuramente facilitata nel comprendere razionalmente quello che stava succedendo, cioè non avevo bisogno dei lunghissimi colloqui perché mi spiegassero um, per avere notizie cliniche, perché um, era più semplice riassumermi le cose. D'altra parte, dal punto di vista umano, dal punto di vista, dal punto di vista della... Um, Uh, dal punto di vista emotivo questo non è servito a niente, anzi forse ha peggiorato le cose perché uh, sapevo cosa poteva succedere e non volevo accettarlo. Ora lo che mi motiva è eh, migliorare la vita della gente. Già non è tanto la tecnica no? come quando eri giovane, perché arriva un punto che la tecnica è tecnica e non ha nessun segreto, sino le piccole cose che possono fare che marcano la differenza. El hablar con el paciente, con la familia, el hacer una educación sanitaria que nadie ha hecho hasta ese punto y tú no lo sabías porque dabas por hecho que lo habían hecho. Esas cosas son las que te motivan, el mejorar el cuidado del paciente. Il el... faut faire du cas par cas, en fait. C'est primordial. Parce que chaque histoire est différente. Et quand vous vous trouvez en tant que patient, en tant que famille de patients, dans cette situation, dans un univers où vous ne parlez pas cette langue-là, cette langue faite d'acronymes et de termes techniques que vous ne connaissez pas, quand vous vous retrouvez face au savoir et que du coup vous vous retrouvez impuissant, que vous vous retrouvez stupide, que vous vous retrouvez humilié, que vous vous retrouvez démuni, comment faire Jokainen lääkäri varmaan pelkää komplikaatiota tai jotakin, että mitään ei, niin kuin, ei hiffaa jotain juttua, mitä, mitä olisi pitänyt hiffata, joskin siinäkin auttaa se, että arvoin tekee yksin, yksin koko päivä töitä. Nämä, nyt, nämä tuli nyt äkkiseltä mulle mieleen. And what scares me is that making those decisions and making those wrong decisions and the realization that that decision uh, of that decision in th three, four weeks' time, where you end up having a patient who, in effect, can be crippled by life-sustaining therapy, um, which may not have been in their best interests or the family's best interests. And that still scares me. And I think it scares a lot of colleagues, but um, intensive care is much more multidisciplinary now, and I think that has helped our decision-making um, and has reduced that um, fear factor. Honesty and... Humility go a long way. 
And most patients and relatives understand that we're also human and mistakes can happen uh, and should be openly discussed. Οι ασθενεί όμω έρχονται σε επαφή με εμά, ιδιαίτερα αυτοί που βγαίνουν από το νοσοκομείο, πηγαίνουν σε κέντρα αποκατάσταση και ύστερα από πάρα πολύ καιρό έρχονται να μα συναντήσουν, γιατί ξέρουν τα πρόσωπά, πρόσωπά μα, τι φωνέ μα, τον αγώνα που δίνουμε μέσα στο χώρο για να καταφέρουμε ε, να του σώσουμε, να επιβιώσουν και έρχονται να μα δουν, να μα γνωρίσουν από κοντά, να του δούμε κι εμεί. Together with my colleagues. In particular, the nursing colleagues, we arranged a wedding for a patient who was at the end of his life and had decided to marry his long-term partner before he later died. And it was very moving to be part of this very special event in the intensive care unit. It's a real privilege to be able to support a patient and their family through that um, what I hope is the worst thing that ever happens to them in their lives, to, to be able to support them through that, hopefully to recovery or to support them um, through uh, managing a dignified death. Il faut, il faut, faut ramener la vie. Pourquoi est-ce que tout est si blanc et voire gris? Pourquoi est-ce que ce lino couine autant sous les crocs des médecins? C'est insoutenable. Pourquoi est-ce que, pourquoi est-ce que tout est autant aseptisé? C'est pas trois photos qui vont empêcher les gens de travailler. Moi, je pense que c'est important de ramener. Euh de ramener de la vie à cet endroit où, euh, où on se trouve euh, à la frontière de, au bord de, on se trouve euh, dans une espèce de no man's land où on sait pas, euh, on sait pas sur quoi ça va déboucher quoi. La opinione della vita intensiva è fantastica perché mi hanno salvato la vita e dopo tre anni sono qui anche a un altro ospedale che mi hanno dato per morto. Per fortuna sono arrivato in questa terapia intensiva e mi hanno salvato veramente la vita. Solo belle cose possono uscire dalla mia bocca ovviamente perché senza di loro non sarei, non sarei qui, ripeto, non sarei qui oggi. Intensive care medicine allows me to learn something new every day. So every day I meet colleagues and I hear of their new technologies, new advances and progress in their particular specialty. But most importantly, every day is a different day with new challenges and I enjoy the interaction with my colleagues and most importantly with patients and their relatives. So it is a, provides a great variety, it's different every day and it's a specialty where progress is made on a, on a regular basis. Grazie perché mi hanno ricordato anche come si lavora. Cioè, io faccio questo mestiere, lo faccio da tanti anni, ci sono dei momenti in cui sei stanco, in cui hai, hai, hai le tue cose, nel senso che hai la tua vita, hai delle preoccupazioni, però Io ero serena quando andavo via, non perché sapevo che non sarebbe morto, poteva morire, poteva star male, ma era nelle mani migliori, sapevo che era nelle, nelle migliori mani e, e questo mi dava, mi dava quel minimo di tranquillità che potevo cercare. È giusto che uh, i bambini che mi vengono affidati e i genitori quando vanno a casa possano pensare la stessa cosa. Siamo nelle migliori mani, quindi dobbiamo sempre fare il meglio. Grazie a loro per esserlo il meglio.
I'm an intensive care nurse and I'm proud to work with a multidisciplinary team um, to, to work together to fight COVID-19. Together we are intensive care medicine. I'm an anaesthetist and I'm proud to be an intensivist. We intensivists are working together to fight COVID-19. Together we are intensive care medicine. I'm a primary intensivist and I'm proud of it. We intensivists are working together side by side to fight COVID-19. Together we are intensive care medicine. I am an anesthesiologist and I'm proud to be an intensivist. We intensivists working together to fight the COVID-19. Together we are intensive care medicine. I am a surgeon and I'm proud to be an intensivist as well. We intensivists are working together to fight COVID-19. Together we are intensive care medicine. Good afternoon, dear colleagues and friends. Once again, we are together in ESICM COVID-19 webinar. Today, we have an interesting title. The title of our webinar is Mind the Ethical Gap. I would now like to introduce the first speaker, Professor Hans Flaten. Hans Flaten is professor and senior consultant at Haukeland University Hospital, Bergen in Norway. He has been a member of European Society of Intensive Care Medicine since 1996, and he has served in different levels of uh, the society. He was uh, chair of the Division of Professional Development, and he was in executive committee for three years. He is also a past chair of the society's health services research and outcome section. We also know him from his uh, position as the principal investigator at the VIP network for the study of very old ICU patients. The title of his uh, the talk today is uh, ICU tri Triage in COVID, from business as usual to what? Hans, please. Thank you, Joseph. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to an exciting topic, which also is very important. I first have to declare no conflict of interest, but I have an acknowledgement. This is the, at least part of the VIP group in the SICM. During our first seminar in Jerusalem in January this year, just before the COVID-19 broke up, and uh, the meeting was uh, about, uh, about um, uh, the elderly patient in the ICU ethical questions. And it was supported by a grant from the government in Germany. And as you may well be aware of, the present pandemic um, have a lot of uh, uh, coverage by the media. Some examples here, in particular when the pandemic uh, stroke so hard in Italy and in Spain, a lot of newspaper had uh, papers also about triage, which is my main topic today. And uh, we've seen guidelines. This is from Norway. It's a Norwegian, but it is the value and priority criteria for for selection of patient in general, um, priority of treatments, priority of diseases, and we have been asked to use exactly the same during the pandemic. This is also a national guideline in the uh, UK from NICE, uh, COVID-19 rapid guideline. And during the pandemic, we saw several guidelines coming up from, uh, from uh, professional societies like this in Italy and in Spain. And lately, we've seen uh, several examples of uh, guidelines for allocation of medical resources and beds in the ICU coming in major journals. So the interest of triage has been there. I want to use this uh, simple pandemic curve illustrating the demand on the left 
and uh, on the right side the available resources as an inverse scale and uh, this is the pandemic curve so during normal capacity in our ICU the, um, the demand will vary a little bit from uh, from day to day and week to week and we may have some small surges but usually we have a well uh, pre-planned uh, balance between demand and available resources as the pandemic grows this normal capacity will be broken very soon depending on the 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 surge and and the spread in the in the community and we will be asked to have an extended capacity but we still are able to find resources and we have resources in uh, terms of rooms post-operative wards surveillance wards observation wards and we can also have equipment from elsewhere also in the operating theater like using ventilators uh, planned for uh, for surgery and anesthesia and then we enter another phase where we have even more extended capacity and we are now moving into three or four times the normal capacity where lack of resources both uh, hardware and software like the, the knowledge of intensive care personnel will be more and more uh, visible and then finally we enter the last phase where we have severe lack or no resources at all and as you are familiar with we have two different very different approach to triage in general we have a what I call the egalitarian approach and this approach based on the principle that all people are equal and we deserve equal rights and opportunity also to healthcare. So here we are entitled to get that. So basically what the egalitarian approach ask what is the best for the patient. In a little contrast to this is the utilitarian approach which is a theory that the aim of action should, should give the largest possible positive balance uh, in the society greatest happiness for the greatest number and that means that care will be given to maximize the overall benefit for the society and this is a strange way to think for us during triage but as I will come to um, we probably have to um, use utilitarian approach in the extreme phases of uh, a pandemic our priority discussions in Norway to come back to that is based on utility if the action increased the probability of survival or quality of life the use of resources and an action using less resources will get higher priority if the result is similar and of course severity if an action have higher priority if the condition is severe with loss of life or loss of function and how to put this together during a pandemic is not easy When we do prognostication, which we do in usual time, we are aware of that age is just a number, and this is also for frailty, and this is a good commentary on this. Um, and strategies to, to inform resource allocation during the COVID-19 based on age and frailty is inherently difficult. Um, we tend to act from group to individual prognostication in this way and on the left side of this slide uh, there's an example of, uh, of patients uh, in the very old group uh, of, of intensive care patients where we can find for example that 60% are dead after around six months and how to transform this to individual prognostication is of course difficult because nobody dies 60% they are either die or live and individual prognostication with close to 100% sensitivity and specificity is at present not available the triage process has been full of controversies and this is a special one arrived in England uh, after um, the COVID-19 rapid guideline was published first time in March 20th and they advocated use of the clinical frailty scale for all ages and that clinical frailty scale less than five should uh, initiate the possible ICU admission and those above five and above then there were um, some doubt about it and this created um, 
outcry, not at least from the disability organization, but also from uh, public and from media. And in fact, um, the COVID-19 rapid guideline was changed because of this, uh, of this uh, protest. And uh, to assess frailty now in the NICE national guidelines, which are very good, they do not advocate to use the clinical frailty scale in the patients aged under 65, only over 65. And they want to use an individualized assessment of frailty instead. Of course, this poses a problem because individualized assessment of frailty usually involves the patient, and the patient is frequently so sick when they come to our ICUs that that could be difficult to do. And that's why the clinical frailty scale has got a lot of popularity in, um, in intensive care, and we've used it a lot in our VIP studies. And the clinical frailty scale is a simple pictographic uh, scale of uh, different stages of, of frailty. The first three are not frail, then we have a vulnerable, increasingly frail, and then number nine is terminally ill. But of course, to use this in individual when you have short time could sometimes be difficult. And uh, if you will try to score frailty in this guy who happens to be in Yoda, uh, will it be five, will it be six? Either way, he will be f probably rated frail, but frailty is not the only thing about elderly people. Uh, Yoda at least has resilience. And resilience has been a lot of discussions in the geriatric um, um, uh, papers uh, recent, the recent years. And maybe frailty and resilience are not necessarily mutually exclusive, although we have thought that there was a negative association only between resilience and frailty. The less frailty, uh, the higher resilience. And resilience, as you know, is uh, defined as a process that we adapt or cope with significant sources of stress or trauma. And this could be increased. So maybe we could focus more on resilience in evaluation of elderly patients in general, and specifically on, in patients in general. Then the difficult task about who should decide. Um, in normal times, in most countries and the most unit, it is the ICU team. Uh, may be uh, reinforced by physicians or, or other health personnel that knows the patient from the time prior to the ICU, a surgeon, for example, or a hematologist, whatever. Um, and they are the ICU team. And this is rather simple. I most find this fruitful uh, when we use mostly egalitarian principle and think what is the best for the patient. And the best for the patient sometimes is to go into palliative care with withholding or withdrawing therapy. In particular, in the elderly population, this is so. Um, the longer we come into the pandemic and maybe util utilitarian principles have been forced upon us or we have chosen, then I think it's wise to have a triage committee or a clinical ethical committee to lead the the triage uh, also in individual patients. A problem is that it is seldom available 24-7, so they just have to make clear guidelines based on the utilitarian principles, so the physician and nurses is not left to this decision alone. So what inference decision making? This is an interesting paper from BMJ some years ago um, where there was a national questionnaire about what influenced doctors' decision in general to admission to the ICU. And what uh, woke my attention was that it's one of the f few places where I found their legal liability being a problem highlighted. And approximately one third of the physician were thinking of legal liability when they um, uh, decided about admission to the intensive care should we admit or not. And is this a problem? Probably yes, and probably larger than we think of. This is a, a recent picture from the Bill of Health, which is a publication in the US, showing the different states in the US. The dark blue one are states where they have COVID-19 specific liability protection uh, during, made not during the pandemic. 
and the lighter blue, um, there they found out that the pre-existing liability protection was enough also for the COVID-19. But you see there's a lot of gray areas here showing that many states do not have this at the moment. And uh, they write in um, the text that uh, there is an enormous statewide variation regarding if and how legal liability protections might be provided to physicians during a public health care emergency. I've not seen something similar from Europe, but most probably the picture would look rather similar. Some have COVID-19 specific liability, some have it in general, and some probably don't have it at all. So, for triage, should we use the utilitarian, the random intake, which is in fact the extreme uh, end of the egalitarian approach, or what? Here is again my simple sketch about uh, different phases from normal capacity to severe lack of resources. And here we have our pandemic curve. And it's evident that going from normal capacity to severe lack of, res of, of resources, we are more or less autonomically transformed from uh, doing egalitarian approach to the patient to use at least some utilitarian approach. And this is highlighted as um, the good way, the way we are used to in the normal uh, uh, intensive care we provide. Then we have the bad when we stretch the normal until we find out that it doesn't work anymore. And we have to turn to the more ugly, uh, in brackets, uh, where we have to use other ways in the utilitarian approach. I will just show two different suggestions in the recent uh, pandemic about um, triage published. This one in Critical Care Medicine by Charles Sprong and co-workers. And they have a generic form where each institution can decide which performance score, comorbidity score, and organ system failure score to use based on experience and what they are used to. And they give priority to those who have a high performance, uh, low ASA score, low organ, number of organ failure, and a high predicted survival rate. And this is, in fact, mostly um, um, uh, egalitarian approach. They think from the patient point of view, what is the best for the individual patient? And priority four is patients who are very sick, have a high ASA score, and have a very low predicted survival. On the other hand, we have this one published in JAMA some weeks ago by White and co-workers, the framework for rationing ventilators and critical care beds. And as you see here, we have the severity here as one of the principles, but then we see life cycle consideration, which is just another way to say they will uh, prioritize younger versus older. So they prioritize those who have the least chance to live through life stages. They think this is a human right, and hence we should uh, uh, prioritize those who are young. But also in the text, we see that in addition, individuals who perform tasks vital to the public health response are given hated priority by subtracting points from the priority score. It is like this, that the higher score you get, the less chance you have to give, be uh, prioritized for an ICU beds. And this is, in fact, mostly a utilitarian approach to, uh, to triage. Just to mention the normal triage in the very old, we have usually three phases. The one is in the pre-ICU, where we uh, triage them to be uh, too well or too sick and accept the admission. Then in a lot of ICUs, there are no vacant beds, so they have to wait for it, and uh, in between. They go to intermediate care, geriatric acute care, or maybe an uh, ordinary ward. In other places, we usually have a bed and admit them. And then we have the third triage, the time-limited trial, which has been increasingly popular in the elderly uh, population. We have some doubt that they will profit from intensive care, but we admit them nevertheless and see what happens the next two or three days and do a reassessment. And if they are not profiting for the treatment, they are maybe getting worse. Then we can have a family conference 
and uh, have limitation of care or withdrawal of care. So in the different phases, this will probably be very much different. We will have uh, too many of the elderly uh, classified as too sick. We will mostly use intermediate units for them, and we will definitely not have the luxury to admit them uh, for a time-limited trial. Just to mention it, um, this is survival according to clinical frailty scale and SOFA score in the VIP2 study. And we can see here that as the SOFA score increases, the outcome gets worse. But at, um, uh, at SOFA score 8, there is nothing magical. Most of these patients above 80 will survive with a good bargain, uh, 55 to 60 percent. So what are the attitudes in the public? It's not much written about it, but this was a study some years ago from US where they engaged the community to ask and ask them key allocation question about um, um, what would you do in situation where there are more patients needing ventilators than their ventilators to use. And they asked, they answered this with um, very interesting, it's, it's a high, um, um, similar answers from the healthcare disaster workers and lay participants that the uh, egalitarian approach with first come first serve or a lottery should not be used and often always was to survive current illness or live longer that means life years saved and also in fact value to others was rated high in addition they said that there are situations where there could be right to remove a ventilator from one patient who needs it to survive and give it to another who is also in need to, to survive, which is a rather extreme utilitarian approach. So to conclude, important steps for guidelines for triage, I think the most important is to engage society, politicians, government and lay people, and to create national guideline discussions. The government has an obligation to participate, in particular if we are going to use the utilitarian approach. Which principles are most acceptable? And they also have to ensure legal liability for healthcare workers during a pandemic. And the only way to do that is to have uh, firm triage criteria uh, embedded into the society. It must foster transparency. The work should preferably be conducted between pandemic and not when one arrives, when we have a lot of other things to think of than doing uh, writing up triage criteria. Educate people about the possibilities and limitations of intensive care so we avoid the unrealistic expectations some have. Increase baseline ICU capacity, strengthen readiness. A lot of countries in Europe have a low ICU capacity and are severely hit and regular pandemic training similar to CPR. And that was the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Hans. Uh, there are uh, several questions, uh, several interesting questions. And actually, I had uh, almost the same question, so I will begin with uh, uh, that one. Uh, it's about you suggesting transparency and engagement with member uh, of the public, uh, the, the, the colleague who has asked this, uh, he or she says, has this actually happened anywhere? Uh, because I haven't heard of it uh, in any country opening discuss, uh, openly discussing it. And I would like to add there uh, something uh, from me. Uh, you have very nicely explained the egalitarian and the utilitarian approach. Uh, and of course, in the utilitarian approach, you indicated that the governments also uh, are obliged to participate there. But if you see uh, the public response, the public explosion uh, in Italy when there was this uh, uh, this uh, discussion of age, uh, especially uh, proposed by uh, CRT, there was an explosion in the public. Uh, so I would like to add the question, how do you think that the politicians would risk uh, <laughs> these sort of things by participating in these sort of discussions. Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, there's not many who have done this, in fact, but this publication I showed you show that it has been done mm -hmm. and it revealed some very interesting results. And probably we should do more of this, ask lay people what they think about it. And to your second question, 
I can understand perfectly that this is very disturbing to come up with in the midst of a pandemic. And that's why I say that this should preferably conducted such between pandemic where people can think rationally. They do not think rationally within the pandemic. So that's why we got all this newspaper writing, I think. If we could do it in a calm face, engage society and have uh, transparency and discussions, I think we can come a wrong way further than we have today. Okay. Uh, there's another interesting question, uh, which we have also discussed it in one of our uh, uh, other webinars. Uh, uh, and this is about uh, high resource demanding strategies, uh, like uh, using ECMO. Uh, the person asking the question uh, says, is it ethic going for this approach and refusing ICU admission at the same time to patients you normally would admit in non-pandemic time? My, question, my answer will be no. It's not ethical to use so much resources on the individual if this is hurting others. So we decided that in the phase one of the pandemic, when we had business as usual, we would also offer uh, occasionally uh, ECMO if it was indicated. But as soon as we arrive phase two or three, we will not turn to ECMO as a solution because we thought it was too uh, too uh, expensive and in terms of, of, of use of resources. Yeah, and uh, then I uh, conclude that with the last sentence of the uh, person asking the question, uh, and I, I would say that is logical, that is going for ECMO only as long as you are able to provide ICU care to anyone who needs it. So that's actually a uh, lower part of your curve uh, that you were showing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then it must be allowed. I agree. If, if you have at the same time enough resources to take care of those who are, are entered. Okay, there is one last question. Uh, has anyone noted a second peak? And is that as worse as first? Now, personally, I heard from Korea and Wuhan uh, that there were uh, some new cases coming up, uh, but I didn't uh, have the idea that we could call it a second peak. Uh, do you know anything else? No, uh, I haven't heard or read anything. And we are also very eager to see that because uh, Obviously, less than 0.5% of the population in Norway have been uh, cont or con uh, uh, contracted this virus. So 99.5 is fertile zone of soil. So we are really scared that if this gets loose, we will have a second peak, but we don't have it at the moment. Okay. Hans, thank you very much uh, for this presentation and nice discussion. We are right on time and uh, now uh, I would like to go on with the second speaker. Uh, and again, uh, th thank you very much. Now the next speaker, I would like to introduce you, Professor Eli Azulay. Uh, professor Azulay is Professor of Medicine, Speciality Pulmonary Medicine and Critical Care Director of the Medical ICU of the St. Louis Teaching Hospital in Paris. He is the director of the research group on the management of acute respiratory failure and outcomes in critically ill immunocompromised patients. And he's the director of the French Familia Study uh, Group, uh, which is uh, a multidisciplinary group funded by the Ministry of Health and French Society for Critical Care, aimed at improving effectiveness of communication with family members of ICU patients. Eli is uh, very well known with his past work on ethics and he was also the past chair of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine Ethics Section and he is the former editor-in-chief of the Society's journal Intensive Care Medicine. Uh, his title is Surviving COVID, Patients, Relatives and Clinicians Perspective. Eli. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to take part to this uh, webinar and to follow after uh, Hans Flatten. Um, and uh, I'm very thankful to the society and I hope that everyone is safe and well. Well, together we are intensive care. And uh, looking at this figure, you can see that many healthcare providers are going to take heavily care for one patient uh, inside a group of people who are at very high risk of uh, mental uh, health outcomes. We are going to address the questions of patients uh, 
relatives um, and healthcare providers. So as many of the studies are actually follow-up of patients after the ICU, I'm going to refer first to the literature on acute respiratory failure. And it's been now more than 15 years that we know that outcomes after RDS, and even if COVID-19 pneumonia is not exactly an RDS at most, um, in most uh, many aspects, uh, we can see that um, after at ICU discharge, uh, patients are very weak. Uh, they have lost a lot, a lot of their body weight um, and they're with a very limited pulmonary function. These works that have been performed by Mark Herridge from Toronto, have also offered not only to assess physical outcomes, but uh, 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 mental outcomes. And this is a very clear example of what can be expected from uh, uh, post-ICU management in patients after RDS. This is a two-year follow-up, uh, and Oscar Bienvenu is one of the very well-known psychiatrists working in the critical care environment. Uh, and in this group of uh, 186 uh, acute lung injury survivors, you can see that not only the levels of depressive symptoms is high, but it's also sustained over time with at least uh, more than 20 months for depression, anxiety, and other mental outcomes. Following patients after five years, you can only say two things. One is recovery cannot be full even late after RDS, but also if you are not young, you are with increased risk of physical and mental burden. So let's now move to family members because patients, we are following them now. We will get late outcomes in about three months and we will be able to compare whether COVID-19 patients after a severe pneumonia are the same than those that are reported in the literature with a severe RDS. What about family members? And we know from the literature that family members are of RDS patients are with increased post-ICU burden. They know We know that they are also even sicker than the patients mentally. And many studies comparing patients and family members after ICU management show that six months after RDS, family members are doing quite worse than the patients when it comes to address um, the severity of post-traumatic stress disorder and depressive symptoms. Um, this is one of the paper about depressive symptoms in caregivers, of, uh, which, is, which actually uh, refers to family members of uh, ICU patients. Um, and you can see that there are two groups of uh, family members, including one of 16% of family members who is going to stay with sustained depressive symptoms long after ICU discharge. When we look um, at the prevalence of uh, depressive symptoms, uh, we know that it's very high, about um, 43% one year after ICU management. Uh, and we also know the risk factors uh, that are uh, exposing these family members to high level of burden. When we look at these risk factors, you can see that it's very much uh, the typology of our COVID-19 patients, uh, mostly young patients uh, with a few social support. Uh, and uh, we know that there are uh, many confounding variables, but we are looking forward also to have data on family members. And we are now collecting data on these family members as many groups in the world are, are doing. When we look at the qualitative data to better address the gap and know what are the needs of these family members, we are focused on communication and informational needs. We need to prepare not the clinicians, not only to provide information to family members, but also to train themselves to the emotional burden of providing very bad news to these family members. And we need to prepare family members to understand the long-term physical and psychological health changes for these uh, uh, patients and family members. And this is one of the numerous paper comparing family papers, comparing family members and patients uh, after uh, acute respiratory failure and RDS. And you can see that um, overall, the level of post-ICU psychological burden is the same in patients having had RDS and in family members who never had RDS, but attended the ICU and were in a very complex psychological situation. Let's go now to the sickest patient. And we know that uh, some patients in COVID-19 have had an uh, ECMO support. Um, of course, we don't have long-term outcomes in these uh, uh, patients uh, but, and the, in these family members too. And we can expect that in the sickest patients, uh, we will have the highest uh, prevalence uh, 
of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in family members than in patients uh, like this one uh, providing an RDS experience in an Italian group uh, published in Minerva Anesthesiologica. And if we go to the sickest of the sickest, the patient who died in the ICU, again, we can see that one of the long-term outcomes in these bereaved family members, which is complicated grief, uh, is very much altered when family members could notice that the patient was not able to breathe peacefully. And again, that put uh, uh, family members of patients with acute respiratory failure at very high risk uh, of post-ICU burden, including in the bereavement. So we developed a strategy to welcome family members in the ICUs. As you know, uh, visitation policies were quite forbidden at many places, but we still encourage family members to visit the patient. Of course, there were limits, um, not only the number of visiting family members, but the time they were visiting, not just to create limits, uh, it's that we didn't want the family members to cross each other in the waiting room, and we didn't want to expose the family members themselves to uh, many uh, visits. Uh, so we limited the number and the length of the visits. Uh, we provided also these family members with a very clearly written information letter explaining the setting and why there were so many isolations, uh, PPEs, and why we were dressing like we are in the ICU at this time. We were setting up routine telephone calls, so family members were able to call on a daily basis, not only the nurse, but also the physicians. But on top of that, we were calling our cell family members, and the medical student did that, um, and they were providing very basic information, and that was very healing for family members. Um, we were also creating um, uh, interactions between uh, family members and the um, the patients and the team by using uh, uh, WhatsApp groups, by using uh, video uh, connections, uh, diaries, text messages. Uh, and this was also a very new way to connect with family members. And I'm sure that this is something that we will keep uh, for the future in our ICUs. And of course, when we were close to the end of life, we started a, a different model where there were no limits anymore. And we were encouraging family members to come to the ICU and say goodbye to the patient because we know that, that that's very healing. And that's also a very good way to decrease uh, uh, post uh, ICU uh, uh, complicated grief. Um, so the teams themselves, we know that these healthcare providers making their best to support the patients, uh, to provide a very heavy care, to support family members and do the best. Uh, they are also themselves frontline with COVID-19. And from the literature, we knew already that there were many different symptoms in these family members, like moral and uh, psychological exhaustion, depression, stress, um, and generous anxieties. Uh, and there are many different common points to these syndromes um, that can be noted in uh, uh, healthcare providers. So many different symptoms, many different syndromes um, that have been quite correctly and extensively sometimes uh, uh, um, uh, surveyed in the literature. This is a paper from Denver on post-traumatic stress disorder in ICU nurses. And if you look at the risk factors for PTSD in nurses, you can see very, uh, you can see elements that are very often uh, uh, encountered in family members of COVID-19 patients. This is another example on the perception of appropriate care. And we know that 27% of um, the physicians and the nurses in the ICUs were noting uh, a peak perception of inappropriate care. And that was a very central uh, causing moral distress. And this uh, study that was uh, performed by the ethics section of the University of Intensive Care Medicine was published in the JAMA and provided um, information from nine European countries uh, and 82 ICUs. And we know that it's uh, very uh, associated with uh, uh, intent to, to leave the, the ICU. When we look at the central elements that are common to COVID-19 and the sickest healthcare providers, we can see that uh, if the patients are very sick, uh, if they are very heavily treated, if we, are, if we may provide them with uh, inappropriate care or with goals of care that have not been appropriately assessed, uh, we are getting to uh, very high levels of distress um, in healthcare providers. And this example of a physician leaving a room of a patient multiple equipped with um, very grim outcomes in one, uh, one of the major reasons why there are conflicts uh, inside the ICU team. 
This is another study performed with the, the, the ethics section of the European Society, where a, a, a large number of ICUs, 323 ICUs in 24 countries were surveyed. Uh, and that was interesting to see that uh, conflicts were reported by about 70%. Uh, and we know that COVID-19, we are now starting to collect information from healthcare providers. And we know that conflicts about the goals of care, conflicts about communication gaps uh, are really present. And we are now working on to see how these acute stress and these acute conflicts will translate uh, in three months uh, in PTSD maybe, or burnout uh, in healthcare providers. And we know that uh, being a nurse is a risk factor, being a woman is a risk factor, but also being frontline is a risk factor. These are the COVID-19 data that I'm going to report in a few slides. And you can recognize here a clinician who can't look at you He's complaining? No, he's not complaining. He's silent. Uh, and most of the time, he's absent. This is burnout. And we know that uh, the, the many studies that have um, studied burnout in the ICU report about 50% of the clinicians um, with severe level of burnout. This is about nurses, about physicians. Um, and according to the studies, risk factors have common points, but also have some interesting differences uh, that are that most of them apply to the COVID-19 setting. Mm -hmm. So you are in your IC, with your ICU staff and you can hear someone who is cynical or someone who is uh, not complaining but indirectly providing information on how chaotic is the ICU experience uh, and how the, the need for support is not really uh, provided for them, you can understand that we are facing feelings of burnout. Um, this paper published in uh, Intensive Care Medicine provides very clear definitions of the different domains of burnout, uh, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced personal accomplishment. And we know that where stress is because you receive too much demand and you are asked to provide too much information, burnout is very different. Burnout is the feeling that you don't have enough support, you don't have enough motivation, and you are actually burning. And these are major differences between something that is very quickly uh, reversible than burnout where the, the management is much longer. So this is the typical figure. Sometimes when you are at work, you are always sleepy. And on the other hand, when you are sleeping, you are thinking on work. This is burnout. And we know that this is paradoxical and also very classic. This is something that you should collect uh, in your colleagues. We need to help each other because then at the end of the process, you are going to be in a leave because you cannot be in the ICU anymore. And we know that absence, which is the 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 perfect characterization of burnout uh, is one of uh, these uh, uh, elements of burnout. So if we are getting now to the COVID-19 mental health for healthcare workers, we know that it's ignored and uh, we don't need to leave that untreated. We need to manage um, and to help each other to face and cope with uh, the mental outcome that we are facing now with COVID-19. We know that many of our colleagues uh, are very exalted, very animated, they are very excited, and they are mostly tired, and many of them are anxious, and many of them are depressive. This is uh, the only one, the, this is a, a systematic review and meta-analysis outside the ICU, reporting a very high prevalence of anxiety and depression, more than 20%, but this is outside the ICU, and these are pooled data from 13 studies. If we are going to the ICU, there is only one study coming from Wuhan, published in JAMA Network Open, a psychiatric journal, and surveying more than 1,200 healthcare providers in a large number of hospitals, and being very clear about what we can expect. 50% of depression. Of course, it's not depression. It's acute symptoms of depression, acute anxiety, and insomnia. And we know that those people who were very much frontline with the COVID-19 experience are at high risk of mental health outcomes. And this is something that we need to bear in mind because we need to follow, we need to recognize, we need to trace ourselves and to help each other to cope with these mental health outcomes. 
Now, a call of action can be sent, and we, uh, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, the critical care physicians and nurses from all over Europe and all over the world, we are facing the same situation. We have to cope with the same problems. So all together, we need to promote our own wellness. Uh, we need, as ICU leaders, to recognize and to be very much aware of the high prevalence of burnout that can be expected from COVID-19. Data will come, as you know, 90 days because burnout has to be registered quite long after uh, the ICU uh, experience. Uh, administrators also need to understand that the ICU work need to be organized to cope with that. Um, funding agencies need to put money to address uh, many research questions about uh, mental health outcomes. And of course, um, the professional societies need to organize webinars on uh, uh, ethical issues about uh, uh, the COVID-19 mental health experience. And this is exactly where we are today. So the three R to deal with uh, these mental health outcomes are to recognize, to reverse, and to build resilience. And very quickly, and these are my last slides, uh, we can have super groups, so we can use a CBT, we can have mindfulness, uh, and many different things have provided um, some preliminary data that are promising. This is a very small RCT about workplace mindfulness uh, showing that you can decrease the prevalence of burnout uh, in healthcare workers in the ICU. And this is a very nice uh, before after study showing that communication is also able to act on the different uh, elements um, of uh, burnout uh, and to reduce the feelings of burnout in healthcare providers. So now there are many different strategies that have been uh, recommended uh, and I just want to emphasize on four different elements and this will be my last slides. Uh, one, we need to improve communication in the ICU and to help each other to understand what we are experiencing. Two, we need to be very cohesive and work with each other and share because I think that this is the only way that we, we can face and we can understand that we are, have had the same experience and we are going to develop the same symptoms. Helping each other is very much relieving. We need to promote well-being. When you have a well-being with three L's, when you have a colleague who is very tired, who is very weak, you need to offer to maybe work a, a, a weekend less or maybe to have two or three days or a week according to how is the ICU of uh, break um, to maybe improve because we know that resting is one of the best ways to decrease anxiety and depression. And of course, uh, we need to refer to the best standard of care for psych psychological support. So to summarize, uh, Acute respiratory failure that characterizes the COVID-19 is putting family members at very high risk of emotional burden, and even more than the patient themselves, but also the healthcare providers are very, very high level with high risk of uh, uh, mental health outcomes. We know that all the settings that were depicted in the COVID-19, including the lockdown, have very much affected all of us. Uh, and a call of action needs to be urgently implemented to avoid undermining what is going to be probably one of the worst uh, COVID-19 complication. Thank you very much. Okay, Eli, thank you very much uh, for this nice presentation. We already have a couple of questions coming from the uh, audience. Uh, what, the one question is, what are you going to do for your medical team to help to recover from all, all these things? Well, I think that there are, there are many things that we are uh, thinking about, uh, and uh, they are uh, grouped in five different actions. One is to talk to each other. And you, sometimes we know that the COVID-19 has been so huge and has been so uh, uh, impressive uh, that sometimes we have had conflicts about uh, ICU admission, about ICU management, the, about uh, ending and the ICU trial in some patients who are very frail. And, you know, these, these hard discussion make that sometimes we were in conflict, but now we need to talk to each other and to help each other to cope with uh, the post-COVID uh, 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 experience. Two is to have break. And uh, we are now collecting, we have collected data, we are now analyzing the data, showing very much that rest uh, and being able to take days off uh, is very much helping to cope with anxiety, depression, because insomnia is reported in one third of the healthcare providers and is one of the major determinants of uh, anxiety and depression. Three is the briefing. 
we are now in a situation that is very weird because we are looking forward to uh, having no second wave, uh, but we are also aware that the second wave may be related to non-COVID-19 patients, uh, and these patients are coming back in our ICUs and they are very heavy to manage, uh, and we, are, we still have a lot of work. Uh, and I think that we should uh, maybe think less about the second wave and address the day-to-day -day, uh, management uh, because this second wave is taking a lot of time about discussions, uh, but the reality is the patient that we have today. Forum is, I think, uh, being able to understand better the risk factors. And we know that we have uh, in our teams uh, people who are at highest risk uh, of psychological uh, uh, events uh, than others. And so we need to recognize them. I think that there are basic elements that help our, uh, our teams to, to detect uh, depression, to detect burnout. Um, and we need to, we at least uh, the ICU uh, uh, directors, we need to be very careful about that. And ourselves, we are sometimes quite tired and we need to make every effort to be held for that. And we are a group of people, we cannot work on our own. So we work with the nurses and we also, the, nur the head nurses, we are discussing on what could be done for the, 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 the nurses and the doctors to cope with that. And the last thing is sometime we need to go back and uh, in our ICUs, we need maybe to prepare a, a big, a, a big uh, fiesta, a big event saying that uh, we have made it. Um, we are now waiting that our colleagues from India, from Brazil, from all the people who are still in the peak or maybe before the peak of the disease. So I hope that after all the peaks, when this will be behind us, I hope that we will do a, a very big uh, a fiesta to, to celebrate that we, 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 we made it. Uh, thank you, Eli. Uh, I just have uh, one uh, comment uh, about the break part, uh, to have a break for our personnel. And uh, uh, this is actually uh, what we uh, try to do now, uh, because uh, when the, the last COVID patients are leaving the uh, department or even before that, uh, of course, uh, all the other specialisms who need to op operate and who need the ICU beds uh, have the perception that we will immediately go back uh, with our full capacity operation and uh, yeah. in one hand, uh, we are uh, telling them uh, be careful uh, because uh, our personnel is extremely tired now uh, on the other hand uh, it's also a moral situation that there are patients out there who are waiting to be treated uh, so uh, it's uh, from, from my point of view it's a very challenging situation to find the balance in between uh, to, uh, to protect your uh, medical and nursing personnel versus uh, to uh, let the patient profit uh, from the uh, operation or ICU stay that they uh, really need so uh, just to indicate that it's uh, quite challenging uh, because I, the patient be held. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we without us uh, surviving there more, uh, uh, psychologically, that will be also very difficult. Yeah, I, I really agree, Joseph. And uh, I would say that uh, even if there is a risk that I'm mistaken, let's say that the risk of second wave at the same level of what we experience is very low or is low enough that we can now consider that the crisis is over and we need to move to something else, to the post-COVID period. Of course, we will have COVID for the next months, but maybe in another magnitude of what we experienced uh, over the last weeks. Uh. So I understand that the surgeons need to operate, they need to do the carcinologic surgery, the cancer things, and the, the very important surgeries and medical uh, management, uh, and not only in surgery, in all the aspects of medicine. So we need to go back to the roots, but everyone is tired uh, and the personnel in uh, these uh, environments has also given a lot. So it's challenging. We, we have had the, the privilege of having people from elsewhere helping, but all of them now left. Um, and I agree with you that we are now is in even a, a, a worse period where we are more vulnerable psychologically and physically, and we need to take care of each other. There's another uh, direct, very direct question. It could be even coming from the Netherlands, if I see the style of the question. Uh, they are asking you whether you have suffered moral distress yourself and how are you managing it? Well, I must say that, uh, as you know, moral distress uh, is a, a very complex situation.
defined. I am myself uh, uh, experiencing a, a lot of different uh, symptoms, uh, mostly related to tiredness. I think that we are very tired uh, and we have difficulty to deep with sleep. And insomnia is one of the major determinants because it deprives you to be to, to be cured from anxiety and depression. So if I'm asked about my personal symptoms, I would say that I will be much better because my colleagues are helping me a lot uh, and I will be able next week to have a uh, two or three days of break uh, and I'm sure I will feel much better later. Uh, Ellie, we have for years we said we need daylight in ICUs. We don't have it anymore because uh, we had to convert uh, our other uh, departments into ICUs. Uh, we said the privacy of the patient is very important. Uh, we, we have opened new wards. Uh, the patients, the beds are very uh, near to each other because we had to have a maximum achievement. Uh, the patient is fearful because they can't see us. They only see our eyes. We are completely covered up uh, uh, ourselves. There is a lot of noise going. Uh, we cannot have any physical contact with the patient except uh, with the, our uh, gloves and uh, uh, protective suits. Uh, we said 24-7 visit of the family. Now uh, some of us uh, don't, cannot allow due to their uh, architecture uh, at all. Uh, even the patient dies alone uh, and some of us can uh, afford uh, to have one person of the family to vis visit once a day. A family is not even uh, when they are allowed to see the patient uh, after maybe one or two weeks, they can't even recognize the uh, loved one because the patient has changed. I mean, it's, it should be very normal that these patients and family members should be having huge amount of uh, trauma. Don't you think so? Much yeah, more I, than I agree. I, I think that uh, you mentioned three elements that are very well known in the literature. One is about isolation. We know that patients have more delirium when they are isolated. Uh, two is about uh, uh, the family uh, visits. Uh, and there is this uh, wonderful Brazilian paper showing that uh, there was more uh, less delirium when the family were in the ICU 24-7. And this is a major uh, uh, health outcome. Uh, and three, we also know that many of the healthcare providers have made different efforts, for example, to have a small picture on uh, the, the, the suit uh, or maybe have their names uh, uh, written in addition to, to, because no one can recognize you with uh, the, the, the glasses and with all the equipments, uh, making that uh, people have made some efforts uh, to, to uh, help family members and mostly patients uh, to cope with that. I just want to emphasize one thing. Yes, we have been uh, recommended, there was a recommendation to limit uh, the, the ICU visits. But I think that this has created also a lot of suffering in uh, nurses and physicians because, of course, uh, you cannot make the best decisions when you don't have the family members. You cannot care for the patient as uh, if, if you have some basic information about her or him because you don't have the family members telling you who is the patient. And I know that that was a cause of suffering and there is much more depression, depressive symptoms in nurses were uh, considering that the family members were missing. So many of us bypassed these recommendations. Of course, we were very, we paid very much attention that family members were not sick, that they were not crossing each other in the waiting room. And we had um, limited ICU visits and now we even went back to 24-7 for all uh, the, the ICU patients because we are back in 100% of our ICU beds. We are no more outside the ICU walls, making it very, very easy as compared to when we were in the surge. Okay, one last question uh, before the time has, uh, uh, is uh, up. Uh, the, the last question says, do you see a place for critical care support in the community as part of the post ICU management? Uh, that's a major point, uh, and I think that uh, this is a very, very good point. I think that we, as a, as a, as a European intensivists, as intensivists from all over the world, I know that people are connected today from many different countries. We have, we are committed to help each other. I think that we have <clears throat> different experiences. We also have a different timeline with the, the pandemic. Some, for some of us, it's over. 
for others it's inside and we help we can help each other not only not only to understand what we are facing and maybe sometimes for technical issues but also for mental issues and i think that um this uh, these different elements making the, the global critical care community can maybe help uh, to cope with the distress of uh, managing the COVID-19 surge is a major thing. It can be uh, uh, informal, but it can also be formal. And I think that all of us has a responsibility to help uh, others to cope with uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, this is a major issue, I agree. That's a very good point. Uh, Eli, thank you very much uh, for this nice talk and for the discussion. And uh, I also would like to thank uh, to all the participants uh, for their attendance and for the interesting questions. And uh, I would like to say uh, thank you and goodbye to you uh, all. Bye. Uh, let's see each other uh, in the next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.